Welcome, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Higher Calling Podcast. I'm Pete Newsom, and this is your source for all things hiring, staffing, and recruiting. Ricky, we're back for another show. How are you today? I'm doing good, sir. Um, had a great weekend. How about you? I, it was good. It was good. We had a birthday. My fantasy teams won. FSU won. The Bucks <laughs> won. Uh, yeah, a lot of winning this weekend, so it was good. Awesome. 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 So, um, so birthday. So I did the same thing on Saturday. It was my niece's birthday, and I took them to uh, Kobe Steakhouse here nice. uh, here in Orlando. And I didn't realize this. It was my son's first time going to Kobe's. Okay. Okay. And, That's an adventure. Oh, to say he was mesmerized is an understatement. <laughs> I mean, I, I've never seen, he's eight years old. I've never seen him so into it. And then, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, the chef does that thing where he throws the egg in the air and catches it with his hat and then it shows up in his pocket later. He was so mesmerized that he tried to climb over to find out where it was on my buddy. I had to grab him back because that hot grill is there. <laughs> <laughs> he was he, half the time I was trying to pull him back because he was just so into the best money I've ever spent way better than a circus. There you go. Good, good fun. That's good stuff. <laughs> yeah, I like was, it. it was. So yeah, I had a great weekend. Yes. I like it. Well, my, my number three turned 16. So it was, uh, nice. he, he's not driving yet. Apparently it's, it, he didn't have the same sort of sense of urgency that I, I did about that where I, I don't even think he's going to be able to get his license for another few months because you have to have your restricted for, you know, I don't know if it's a, year, a full year, I think now. And so, um, yeah, he, he's, he's got a few months to go. It's weird. None of his buddies seem to, to be too eager to get, get their license either. I think we make it too easy for him driving him around everywhere. I'm noticing that these days, I'm noticing that a lot of people within driving or restricted driving age, they act radically different than I did at that age. Cause I could not wait for me to get my license. I cannot wait for me to be on the road. And I'm talking to a few of my nieces, which they're at that age. I'm like, yeah, my mom takes me. I'm yeah. Like, hey, isn't that <laughs> fine. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. It's, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a definitely a change, yeah. but I'm not complaining. I mean, it saves, yeah. you know, any pressure to, to get him a car or worry about him on the road. So listen, I'm, I'm, if he wants to, to, to slow roll that I'm, I'm all good with it. That's for sure. <laughs> You're good with it, and your insurance company is amazing with it too. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. Exactly. So, so happy awesome. birthday all around. We're, right. Here we are doing another podcast, and yes, today we're, we're not even going to try to pretend that we, we just stumbled across this topic. We're um, we I put up a blog last week that has to do with leadership in the workplace, and you and I were talking about that, and you had a couple thoughts on. Um, on, on how to be a leader in the workplace in addition to what was already included on the blog. So we're each gonna talk about a few points today and I will I will let you go first. How about excellent, that? Excellent, well, you know, this is this is a topic, Pete, that's near and dear to my heart because I, I am a firm believer that, and, and I know people are gonna cringe when they hear this, there's no bad students, just bad teachers, right? And there's no bad employees, just bad leaders. Um, so I am, I am, this is something that I really do believe in. I really do care about because it it really ties into how influential somebody is. So when I saw this and I'm like, oh, this is perfect, especially right now, especially right now when you've got the the great resignation, all these folks that are leaving left and right, um, it's really good to kind of come back and start taking a look at the uh, every leader's tool belt, what kind of tools they have in their in their tool belt. And if we have a leader that hasn't taken a look at their set of tools in the past five years or 10 years, then you're in for a rude, awaken rude awakening because you got to update those, those tools constantly. So I'm looking at this, um, at the, uh, at the blog and, you know, it talks about being a mentor and taking, you know, asking for feedback, taking a course, you know, to improve yourself and doing the right thing. But I wanted to talk about the different kinds of leadership out there. And to me, Pete, there's no bigger definition about being a leader than just being influential, because to be a leader is to be influential, is to influence. And then um, it, it's, it, it, it took me back to when I was talking to my students a few years ago about the difference between a transactional leader and a transformational leader. 
and I think people it's I, I'm not sure if a lot of leaders out there really know that difference between being a transactional leader and a transformation. So that's the one I want to throw out there. My first one is a knowing that difference and b choosing which one you want to be. So if you could just bear with me, I'm going to explain that difference right now for people who don't know because you can easily do this, right? So transactional leadership. This is a leader that comes in, they tell an employee what to do, they tell them how to do it, right? So they say, I want this done, and I want it done ABC way. And it's an exchange, right? I'm telling you to do this, you're going to do it, and I'm going to check later. Yeah, you're overseeing the work. But the difference to that is the opposite of that is the transformational leader. This is when somebody comes in, and they say, you know what, I want ABC done. Now I'm using Lehman's term here. I don't care how you do it. Just take care of it. And I'll come back in a week and I'll see how you are. If you have any questions, give me a call. Let me know that shift in mindset, what that does to the employee versus the, the transactional leaders. Like my boss wants me to do it like this in this specific way versus the tr transformational one. When the employee says, holy crap, my boss is trusting me <laughs> to do this with my talent, my way, as long as I get the outcome that he or she is looking for. So to me, it's really important to fully understand those two things. One is a little bit micromanaging. Uh, now, sometimes you do need that, right? Sometimes you do have to micromanage um, some, some people in some situation, but not 100% of the time. But if you're constantly putting your employees in a situation that they get to use the skill set that we hired them to do, then that is when you transform that person from an employee, quote unquote, into somebody who's really invested in the bottom line of whatever goal the business has, because the leader is putting that employee in a position of making a difference off the bottom line with their particular skill set. So that is my first one. I don't know if that makes sense or not. For everybody it, it does. I, I think, um, you know, that is, you know, it, it's a good, it's a great goal to have, right? As as a leader, to um, give your employees the opportunity to uh, to thrive and to you know, apply their own creativity, way of doing things. But you know, I wonder how much risk there is in doing that. Uh, you know, where not every employee wants that responsibility. Because that's a yeah that, that that could be a pretty big burden you know yep. to to put on a, an employee. So uh, I would I would suspect that along the way you have to you know still pay close attention to how it's progressing, right? To how how the you know, if it, if if it's an assigned task, for example, how well that's going. Any any thoughts on on how to manage how to manage that? Because while intentions are 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 great, you know the the outcome may not be what's what's desired. I do have an answer for that, right? And I say this in all of my classes, Pete, you need two things to be a leader, people skills and a backbone. If you don't have either one of those two things, either go out and get those skill set, or if you don't want to get them, find something else to do, because this job's going to be really hard for you then. But it, it's uh, the backbone, it's not just a word, the backbone, it, it, it's, it really is a mindset. Because the risk there is, is that what if the employee doesn't do what he or she is supposed to do? Well, that's the risk. Right now, it all goes back to hiring, right? Because I'm not, I want to make sure that I hire the right person for the right role at the right time. What does that mean? That means that I've got to make sure that I don't let the time this position has been empty dictate what kind of person I'm going to have in there. I got to stick to my guns and my strategy about what kind of skill set that I want. If I do my due diligence to bring this leader, this employee in, um, for the right reasons, at the right time, at the right job, then that that worry of maybe having a risk is significantly lower. Because the sure. person you put in that position is somebody who you can trust to actually move that needle from A to B. Now, do mistakes happen? Absolutely. And do you sometimes have to make sure, especially in those critical projects and those critical uh, and, and those projects that are a little bit out there and intricate, yeah, you do have to get your hands a little bit dirty to make sure that they're still going in the right direction. But that should be a byproduct, not the actual goal, right? Because once you start going here or there, yeah, you got to kind of nudge them back into place and you put it and, and you nudge them back into place. 
when I'm training a new leader, I keep telling them, don't you ever, ever micromanage your employees because you're just wasting your time, right? Well, so it sounds like, it, you know, to, to some degree, you know, you, what you're suggesting is it's easier to be a leader if you have the right employees to lead. Is it easier? Yes, it is easier. But being a leader is hard, right? So it's more hard than easy, but it's, it's uh, people don't do it just because it's easy. Uh, so yeah, it would be easier if, if we had the right employees. But here's the thing, Pete, if, if I don't have the right employees in my, on my team, then that's my fault as a leader. Because A, either I brought them on, right? And that was all me. And maybe they told me a story that that sold me on that skill set. But as soon as I realized, uh, -uh that's not the skill set. Okay, bye. Then it's up to me. And that's not easy to do, right? Because depending on what kind of project you got going on and 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 what kind of other other um, uh, ingredients you have in that pot, that makes it really really hard. But that's what being a leader is all about, though. So ma making the right decision up front and then making the hard decision if and when necessary. Early. I think Early. you said it. I learned. I learned an 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 awesome phrase that I used it the the other day. I learned it from you. Didn't you say, "Bad news early is good news." I think Bad news early is good news. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I say so that often. You so you said that a couple of actually it was a couple of months ago, right? And uh, I'm I'm not gonna get too far into it. I was having a conversation with my wife a couple of weeks ago, and I used that 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 same phrase. It okay. did not go well for me, Pete. Let me, yeah, let me just say <laughs> that that is that is that is probably not a good idea no. using the phrases that I use at work on your wife. Oh, dude, that is, that it is did not, not, not go well for me at all. But um, but yeah, you know, uh, but as far as having a bad employee or a bad situation, you know, once you find out that 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 news about whether they're not doing good or are they salvageable that's something different but the earlier you find out about it the earlier you handle it um the better uh your the better position your team is going to be right? yeah I, it, it, it's a, it's a good thing to bring up because it goes without saying or perhaps it's necessary to say that one of the things that that's necessary uh in leadership is to make those hard decisions that yeah. you you don't want to make but have to make um yes. you know, or or you know, to to get rid of an employee who you like who you enjoy yes. being around but is bad for the business is probably one of the hardest things to do as a as a leader or as someone who's in that um that position to make those decisions yeah. i know i've struggled with it uh, greatly o over the years um you know but on the other side of it, I've never regretted acting you know, once getting to that point. And yeah, I, I think that's an area that I've needed to work on in my own leadership skills and development over the years is not letting those situations linger because it's not good for anyone. If you ultimately know where it's going to, if you know, once you identify that an employee is, is not a good fit, you're not doing them a favor by letting it you know, that situation linger. In fact, it's the opposite. You're doing them a disservice because it doesn't give them the opportunity to advance elsewhere in their career where they could thrive, where they could um, have a happy ending. Yeah. And you know, but in the moment, those those are those are challenging you know decisions to make, to say the least. Right? Yeah. It, well, that's what makes this you know this job hard. That's what makes that role so hard. Right. And that's what you need that backbone because you are going to look, you're going to have to um, have difficult conversation with people you don't like. The hardest part is having conversations, the difficult conversation with people you do like, especially letting go of a of an employee due to performance who used to be a peer and you guys used to go to lunch all the time. It, it's difficult. I, I will tell you, I, I, yeah, this, this is a story I, I've, I've brought up before to you, but the single hardest situation I've ever been in in my professional career was when I was promoted from you know, my peer group, this is going back you know, quite a few years, um, to a management role. And that was a struggle because yeah. not everyone was was happy in that situation. <laughs> One person in particular thought that they that job should have been theirs. And 
this was someone who I considered a friend. I went, did go to lunch with just like, just like what you described. And suddenly it, it, it was an adversarial relationship overnight. And that, that is its own set of challenges. And I had to grow up a lot. I mean, I was much younger professionally, but that was a, that was a big um, evolutionary step for me in leadership is to realize you have to rise to the position that you're in. And just because, you know, someone was your, your peer in the past, there, there, there becomes a difference and those differences are real. They're, they're, they're very real. It was painful. I, I, I had similar, uh, similar experiences when I really had a hard time with that. And about uh, 15 years ago, when I first got my own team and I was having a hard time with that because I got promoted into a situation where now I'm overseeing a lot of my former peers and my senior director told me something that stuck with me, stuck with me a long time. And she, and, and she said, Ricky, you know, it really, it is on you to let them know that is boss first, friend second. And you have to train them on how to live that expectation at work. That's number one. Number two, um, if, if, if your friend puts your job in jeopardy because he or she is putting your friendship over what that relationship is like, then they're not a real friend, a real friend. And that one hit me, Pete. That one hit me, I'm like, oh my gosh, she is 100% right. Because me as a friend, right, and, and if, if I got a buddy of mine, he gets promoted, right, and if I start gaffing off and not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, making him look bad, just because I think we're friends and he's not gonna hold me accountable, then what kind of a friend am I, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's putting his, you know, his, his career in jeopardy. And she told me that, and ever since then, for 15 years, that has been how I've been operating, and it has been one of the best advice I was ever given. And I that's a good, it. that's a good lesson. My mine was much more straightforward. It was clear that that we weren't friends anymore, and uh, <laughs> it was, uh, it, you, you know, it what? was sabotage from the start. Huh? <laughs> They're yeah, lost, it, then, but, so. but you know, it, it, it um, you, 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 you know, like any challenging situation, you have to. You, the goal is to is to take something away that that allows you to be better equipped the next time. And so, you know, let, let, let's use that as a segue into a point that I wanted to, to bring up, um, which is, you know, don't, don't be afraid of failure as a leader. And, you know, I like to think of it as being vulnerable. And it, it's something that, that I think about a lot. I talk about quite a bit, get, bit too, because not everyone, it, that doesn't come easily for everyone. Um, you know, you, you have pride, you have an ego, we, we have, um, a lot of people have a tendency and maybe most people have a tendency to, um, not openly acknowledge mistakes to avoid, you know, getting to that point. And to me, a, a leader, you know, should have the opposite traits. You, you should you'd be quick to acknowledge when you make a mistake, you should be quick to, you have to be willing to make a mistake. And so that's why I put that in the, in the blog, because it's something that I see is, 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 is a necessary you know, thing to possess. If, if you're going to be, because to be a leader, you have to be trusted. And so if, if I don't know, if I don't trust that you will tell me when you make a mistake, then I don't know that I can trust you at all. Right. It, it, because we know that that's a part of life. It's a part of business. It's a part of, of having a relationship. Not everything's going to go well all the time. We know that even though we we strive for things to, to go uh, to go well, it's it's not practical. And so you have to you know, be willing to openly and quickly you know, admit when you're wrong and, yeah. and, and when you've when you've done something that um, you know, was a failure. And. I, I think that's a pretty, I, I think it's unfortunately not a prevalent thing. I don't know if you disagree with that, but I think people struggle with that. I, 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 I know people struggle with that piece. So I do agree with that because, you know, it, it's, 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 look, I was, I was in the Marine Corps a long time ago, right? And I was there for four years. And let me tell you, when I went through there, Pete, from 95 to 99, that is back then that is an organization that did not tolerate mistakes 
And I mean did not. God help you if you show up to formation two seconds late. <laughs> I mean, God help you. The gunny doesn't want to know. The sergeant doesn't want to know why you were late. You're in trouble because you're late, right? But, you know, and I take a look. I guess I've got some buddies that, that, are, that are still in, and they tell me all these stories about um, the type of Marines that they're leading. And it's a new military, a new structure when they encourage giving the – opportunity to learn from mistakes but you got to be careful because look if i'm if i make a mistake at work pete the worst that can happen is okay maybe we lose some money fine in the marine corps if you make a mistake people die <laughs> right they that so it's two completely different um uh environments but i guess what i'm saying is is that the best way um where a leader can learn the most valuable lessons is through failure and if they allow themselves to be vulnerable enough to be okay and not look like a perfectionist enough to where you're able to fail here's and pete here's the part that some people forget and you learn from that failure right you, you have to learn from it because if you keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again it's no longer a learning opportunity it is not a disciplinary action opportunity <laughs> right now it's just a problem <laughs> right now it's something completely different and if you as a leader live that mantra and you build a culture of trust with your team and you do the same thing with your team, you encourage, I don't want to say you want to encourage failure. You want to encourage them to have the critical thinking skills to take calculated risk appropriately. Right. I think I said that right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you, you, so I, I do want to separate a little bit, you, you know, you mentioned as an example, and I don't think this was, this was, intended to be an example of you know, having anything to do with leadership, but you know, when you show up late, right, that's, that's not, you know, that, that's almost to me an inexcusable act it versus a making example. a mistake, right? <laughs> and well, you did, you, you, you had to do your Colonel Jessup, you know, moment, people die <laughs> if you make yeah. a mistake. So, you know, you had to, you know, it's, it's crazy how often references from a few good men apply, you know, <laughs> universally, oh, but amazing movie. Uh -huh. uh, it is it, it, top 10 for sure yeah. that, um, but you, you, you have to first be accountable and responsible and reliable a, a, as a leader. Now that really it, it, you know, has to be in place all the time, but making a mistake is different in my mind, right? Making a mistake that, that because you went, you know, hundred percent in the wrong direction, um, you, you got off, off track versus, Hey, I was lazy and didn't show up on time, or I wasn't attentive enough, or it wasn't as important to me because that is where, you know, actions speak so much louder than words. Yeah. And if you're not, well, if you're not, if you're a leader who can't show up, if you can't show up on time, then no one's going to trust you as That's a leader. True. So yep. that, that is, and I know you weren't using that as an example, yeah. <laughs> but I did want to want, want to clarify that because that that's, that's not a leadership, a forgivable you know, no, thing to do. You're right. <laughs> right. It, you know, but it, it's, but I like to bring it back to the culture of trust. So yeah, that, that, that may not have been a good example in there, but boy, do I got a story for you later on um, about that. Uh, yeah. So um, it, it's, it's, it's all about building that culture of trust, Pete. And, you know, I've, I've learned throughout the years in the last team that I had, whenever I bring a brand new employee on, um, I do my regular orientation, the Ricky way, take them out to breakfast, have a, you know, the first couple of days, have a conversation about what is expected of them of the role. But I, I wanted to walk away from our conversation with this, that if you make a mistake and you know about it, I need to hear from you first, number one. Number two, it, it, it's, it's don't be afraid to take those mistakes. Don't be afraid to step out on a limb because we don't learn unless we try different things, right? Right. But I, I hired you on my team because you have great, to me, emotional intelligence and critical thinking skills are tops, right? If you have good emotional intelligence skills and then you have good critical thinking skills, you're gonna take calculated risk, right? If you take calculated risk and we fail, let's take a step back. You tell me about it, let's look into it. That way we can learn from it and figure out a strategy. That way it doesn't happen again later on. Right. And what that did, Pete, it, it at first, the first six months of somebody starts, they tell me everything. <laughs> 
right? Because they're like, I don't want to get Ricky mad. You're not going to make, you know, make me mad. It's okay. But they start figuring out what kind of things I do want to know. And they realize that, that, that that's how you train them on what kind of information they give you, what kind of culture of trust you have with the organization. So they start telling you all these things and you start getting into a tempo and this groove that builds this trust and this loyalty that never existed before. And folks, I'm telling you, if you try that out there, have that, that, that open relationship, those heart to heart conversations with your employees, you will be surprised how vested they're going to be in that bottom line. Yeah. And uh, you know, a leader is not, does not need to be perfect. A leader does not need to be infallible. Um, and you know, when I think back to the example I, I, I gave of when I was first promoted into a management role as a young professional, I got that wrong. I, I thought that I needed to not show vulnerability. I need to show strength and and confidence and 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 yeah. authority. And the reality is, I had already showed those things through my actions to get him to promote it into the role. And, and, and that's why I was there. And I just, I didn't need to show those things other than by example and, and continuing to, to establish, you know, portray the traits that got me there in the first place. And, you know, I look back now and, and think, boy, I would have handled that completely differently, <laughs> but the, you know, a recurring theme from this conversation so far is it's, the mistake is not, um, you know, is valuable if if you learn from it. Otherwise, it's just a mistake. So that is always the the important thing. Even even look, you, you can make a mistake that, that that can cost you your job, and that can seem awful. Yeah. But you could still be better for it in the long run. Sure. And so, um, you know, the the goal is still bad news early if necessary you know it, 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 it's good if it if there's going to be bad news get it out there early but don't be afraid to make a mistake but but don't don't make one out of you know out of apathy or or laziness right make one because you were trying to improve a situation you were trying to um you know, make make the workplace better and whatever that means in your, your particular situation but um but but fear is is not is not a good way to operate um you know but 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 you know, be vulnerable i i i think i think we we need more of that in in the workplace for sure so so vulnerability and not being afraid to fail pretty much that's the same thing it yep. is i've got it all right i got one empowerment and oh pete i could talk about this one forever <laughs> <laughs> for, well, we'll, we'll lose we'll lose people quickly if we you, will. If I know, right? Because I I so. tend to go down that uh, that uh, that a uh, rabbit hole. So I'm going to mention two two uh, thought leaders in the leadership space. That's Simon Sinek and Tom Peters. Um, Tom Peters, what I learned from him, and it, it, it's I saw this te not a TED talk. I saw him in an interview of, of uh, a long time ago, and he says the most important words in an employee employer relationship is what do you think and that hit me that really hit me in a meeting instead of telling people what you think or what needs to happen listen to what they have to say listen to all the issues that your team is going through from their perspective don't give your perspective because you're the expert in your own perspective but you're doing yourself a disservice as a leader if you don't give your employees an opportunity to 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 voice their concerns, to voice their opinion from their lens. So if you stop and you ask them, what do you think? Guess what that does? The person who always thought that he or she was never um, uh, impactful in any meeting, all of a sudden, oh my God, they care what I think. <laughs> That's sure. what that does, right? Yeah. And that empowers them. The other one is Simon Sinek. And Simon Sinek said something uh, at a TED talk years ago that really stuck with me. And you're you're gonna you're gonna say Simon says right no, now. No. <laughs> okay, go on. I had to. All right, I wasn't even going that route, but yeah, I know you Simon aren't. But that's, that's 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 all I could think of. I had to get it out. Okay, go. Oh, okay. Simon so, uh, says. Simon Sinek said, <laughs> he said, you know, in every meeting you have with your employees, the worst thing you can do is talk first. That's the worst thing you can do. The best thing you can do is speak last, and the reason for that is that. People may know you personally, but most people are afraid of your title. 
and they're afraid of your name tag. So if you speak first, whatever idea you may have, nine times out of 10, you're going to have other employees that are not going to want to go against what you're saying. And they're going to go along those lines, right? With the exception of a few. So you're never going to get the real true picture of what's happening. Versus if you ask them, here's the problem. What do you guys think? Let everybody talk. Let everybody give you their, their opinions first. And then you say yours, whether it's different or not, it doesn't matter, but you've got the real true opinion. You do that very often, every now and then what's going to end up happening is employees are going to feel comfortable to speak up. They're going to feel empowered to, to, uh, to speak up. And that is what you're looking for. You want employees who are not afraid to tell you when it is hitting the fan. Because if sure. you create an environment where they're afraid to tell you that, you're going to be blind to a lot of indicators in your business to where it, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt yep. that business. So to me, it's, it's taking those, those, those blinders off. And one last one with empowerment. And this one, I've said this before in class, and I've said this before in other HR conferences, and people look at me weird. I like to give my employees an opportunity to screw me over. And here's what that means. And people are like, what are you saying, Ricky? Here's what that means. If I hire the right person for the right job, for the right reasons, for the right skill set, I automatically, I, I, I trust them to do a job. I do. And if I have, just an example, if I have a presentation that I need to give to the executives, I'm going to go to this employee and say, hey, so-and-so, I need you to put this together. You're going to present to the executives. I want ABC, start working on it. I'll see you in a week. Let me know how you're going. Now, here's one of two things are going to happen. Either the employer is going to say, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm in charge of this project. I cannot let Ricky down. And they're going to knock it out of the park, Pete. That's number one. Number two, the employer is going to say, whatever. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And he's going to embarrass me in front of everybody. Now, that's a risk, right? It is a risk. But guess what? Now I know who that person is. And now I know to take action. And bad news early is good news. So now I found out right now what kind of person that is. I'm going to get rid of you. If you, if I give you this opportunity to screw me over and you actually do, it's never going to happen again. Not, not here. <laughs> right? So it takes guts. It takes, it really takes a backbone to be able to have that kind of mentality because you're putting yourself out there in front of the executives, in front of your bosses. You're putting yourself out there, right? At the, at the mercy of your employees. But so are you, are you suggesting that in that scenario, that do you believe that given the responsibility that the employee clearly knows is, is placed upon them in that situation, if you're not checking in, if you're not involved, if you're not going to see this presentation until it's given to the group, right? Publicly. <laughs> Oh, I'm that, not saying that. <laughs> oh, you're not saying that. You're not going oh, no. that far. Oh no, Pete. No, 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 no. I'm I'm not gonna micromanage you on 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 how I want this done, but I'll leave you to your own devices based on the on on, on the goals and vision that I gave you. Now, am I gonna check in on you every couple of days just to see that you that, that you're on the right path? Absolutely. Are we are you gonna present that to me a day before today's before to make sure you get everything right? Absolutely. That still is gonna happen. But nonetheless, they're doing it, right? They're going to present it. They're going to get out there in front of everybody. Now, if two days before you present to me, I'm like, oh, my God, this is horrendous. That's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I have and I have to fix that, right? Because either I didn't give good guidance, I didn't give a good coaching, or I wasn't checking in yet frequently to kind of nudge them into the right direction. So I got to take ownership of that. Sure. Um, I, I like it. I mean, I think that... Um that that makes sense and i i i can tell you as you know the uh, the owner of a business you know for for you know, over 15 years now there's nothing more valuable to me than when an employee takes ownership of something you know on their own and without being asked it, it takes something forward so it's a little bit different than what you just described but similar as well in that you you want to give people the opportunity to operate autonomously yep. and to um, do things, you know, bring their own ideas forward. And, and that's, you know, in a, in a business our size, it's critical because, you know, I have, it's been years since I've had 
outside uh, work experience. So, you know, I'm you know kind of in this bubble now as I've been for, you know, almost 16 years where the only way I'm going to learn and evolve, and that is to say the only way my ability to help the business you know, grow and evolve is to have outside expertise, outside ideas, new ideas, unique things that, that I wouldn't have otherwise thought of. And I, I can tell you that, and you know this, um, that, that I crave that. The business needs that. And too few people are either, I don't know what it is, either willing to uh, do that or, or just lack the desire to bring ideas forward to um, to solve problems you know, other than identify problems, right? Like there's different levels. There's mm-hmm. identifying a problem. There's identifying a problem and a solution. Like that's that's the next best thing. Bring bring the uh, you know it, it, don't just tell me a problem, right? Because I know there's I know when there's a problem. Don't you know? And then if you're going to tell me there's a problem, you come to me with a solution if, if you can, but ideally tell me about it after you've solved it. And I can tell you when I think of leadership and the traits that I've identified with, with different employees over the years, not, none are greater than those who fall into that scenario. And, and you know, I don't know if perhaps you know, we don't have, we at times don't set the stage correctly for that. Do we, do we not impart you know, that um, knowledge um, on to our employees. I mean, we talk about it. I know th- that we do, but I still think it's it's an uncomfortable place for for a lot of employees to to say, "Gosh, do I am I going to call the baby ugly?" You know, yeah. so to so to speak. And the the you know, the message that I would want to give to every employee is, "Yeah, you you do," because no one wants to be the emperor with no clothes. Yeah. And that's something that that over the years that I've seen is either you know lacking you know, at times or just a, a godsend you know for for employees who are um, willing to step up and take you know, accountability and to me that that's what you know is such an because I can grant you power as a leader by putting you in a position of authority right but you can be an even more effective leader without the title with, with, you know, and that's, you know, we, we all hear this, right. You know, operate, what's, what's the phrase, you know, operate in the job as, as if you're in the job you want, or, you know, and, and, and to me that, that is the way to do it by looking for solutions, taking those steps before someone asks you to do it. Um, Got it. That to me is stress for the job you want, isn't it? Isn't that the phrase? That's part of it, <laughs> okay. that, but, but I think there's more to it than that because it's, it's not about it's not about dressing the part; it's about acting the part. True. <laughs> and and I, I think you know, as if employees want to stand out, and and you don't you, you know no one has to tap you to be a leader for you to actually be one. You, you do it through your actions. You look for those opportunities, and I, I think of. Um, it was just, just a small thing, but it was so impactful. Years ago, we had a relatively new recruiter who happened to answer the phone of um, a, a new client, an important you know, call that, that came in and whoever was, you know, should have, the call may have even been for me, uh, you know, and I wasn't there at the time or whoever the call was for, the person wasn't there. And they just said, how can I help you? How, how can, how can, you know, it's such a simple, straightforward question and they took it and ran. No one asked, and it probably wasn't truth be told necessarily even the, the, the right thing to do. This employee was so new, but they had this inherent trait of wanting to, wanting to, wanting to solve a, a, you know, avoid a problem that's better than solving one. They wanted to, to, you know, to handle whatever it was and they did. And I got, I remember hearing the story later in the day and it was, it was a top 10 moment for me in, in business, quite frankly, it, 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 that, that this person, you know, and I you know, promoted the, this, this individual within you know, days, maybe weeks, but soon after, because it just stood out as, as, I, I got this call. I asked if I could help. 
And then I actually helped and, and <laughs> solved this person's you know, yeah. who, who called in there you know, without like involving anyone else and told me after it was done. And I'm like, man, that, that is, see that that's just, you can't teach that. Right. You, you cannot. You cannot. And, you know, that reminds me of Tony Shea, you know, the uh, the founder of Zappos who who did pass away. So, you know, the story with him and the uh, and the conference in San Francisco. What no, happened not, him? no, not about not about well, this specifically. Well, you know, Tony, right? Tony mm -hmm. Shea. The, uh, OK, so Tony Shea was the CEO of uh, of Zappos a long time ago. This was I read about this about 10 years ago. He was at a conference right way before Amazon bought Zappos. Right. And he was at a conference and he's telling people about his company that they sell shoes and he was like that's so what so you you sell shoes what's so big about that and he's like no well we care about the service the the employees and the customer now obviously a, a shoes a pair of shoes for zappos is about 25 percent more expensive than you going to walmart or, or somewhere else but he was making a killing so anyway he was having drinks with a lot of other ceos and it see the other ceos just didn't believe him about how his employees are of service and he's like you know what I'm putting my, my reputation on the line. Here you go. Here's my 800 number. Go ahead and call and ask them anything you want. Right? So, okay. I'll take you up uh, on that offer. One of the CEOs calls and, and somebody answered. And instead of the CEO asking for shoes, he's like, look, um, I'm in a conference in San Francisco. I'm trying to find a good spot for pizza. Can you help me out? Now, this was at a time <laughs> before smartphones were, were relevant, right? Before anybody can actually Google it. And the guy on the other end, without skipping a beat, sure, what's your address? And looked it up and did this and then that and it helped them without and without asking why are you going to buy shoes? Nothing. And they were impressed. That is why people are willing to spend 25% more on shoes because you're not selling a product, you're selling a service. Love it. That's yeah, great. So same thing. So that's awesome. Love it. That's okay. a great, that's a great story. Yeah. That, that, that's it. So that one sticks out. <laughs> so look, look for opportunities. And that's a point I want to make there. And I think with that, do you have any, do you have any others? Did you hit your points? I, you know, in, I got, one I, I went through the ones that I wanted to highlight from the blog. Well, I got one last one. One last one. Let's do and, it. And it's uh, it's, it's called asking permission to give feedback. This one is big with me. And I learned this exactly about seven years ago from a gentleman by the name of Keith Anderson. And I'm calling him out by name because he was a, he was a, an executive for, for, for a, um, a training and development. And he taught me a lesson that I'm like, I'm taking everywhere. And he's like, you know what, Ricky, if you give somebody feedback and the feedback is unsolicited, they already are on the defense. They're on that defense. But if you approach it like this, instead of saying, instead of saying, Hey, you know what? I heard you on that call. You messed up, blah, 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 blah. They're on the defense. They're not going to take that feedback. But what if you do this? If you just, you hear what happened, come across that employee later. I'm like, Hey, you know what? You got a quick second. Hey, I just heard you in the call. You, you were doing a great job. I've got some great points that can help you close that deal a little bit quicker. If you're okay, can I give you some some points that can help you out? Can I give you some feedback? Now, the person who doesn't know they did something wrong, they're going to be like, well, I don't know what that feedback is. Absolutely. You have their undivided attention, Pete. And you give that feedback. Now, I don't know how true this statistic is, but he he told me if you do that, this 75% chance more likely that they're going to take that feedback and run with it than you telling them without asking permission to give that feedback when their defense was up and they were looking in the back of their mind, all the different ways why you, the person giving that feedback, is wrong because you don't understand the entire story versus asking for permission. They're open, they're willing to listen, and they're going to incorporate that into the next call. It was, it was, I don't, I'm not going to say life changing. That's a little bit over dramatic, but it was an impactful moment for me. <laughs> so I, I would think, tell me that. So, I, you know, a lot of that has to be in the, in the tone and oh, you know, yeah. the delivery of the question, right? Not, Hey, can I give you some feedback? Hey, you suck. <laughs> <laughs> right? I can't or, do that. You're right. Or, or, or but yeah, there's. Uh, I, I like that. I'm gonna. I'm gonna think about how to incorporate that myself because you, you're right. If you if you just start launching into whatever it is, you know, because you know, now I 
assume that most of the time that happens, the feedback's not going to be overwhelmingly positive. No, yeah. So, you know, because everyone's going to welcome that. So, but, but I think, I think that makes a lot of sense is that you, you do want to set, set the tone uh, for, you know, what's going to happen next and, and let the person know that you're, you're, you're doing it in their best interest. Right. Uh, Cause that's, that's the whole purpose of feedback and consistent with what we keep talking about, which is mistakes are okay, provided you learn from them, provided you improve from them. And it, you know, that really ties everything together for me is that, you know, leader, leadership is about you know, being open. It's about, of course, doing the right thing yourself, but also, you know, setting a stage for, you know, for mistakes to be okay. Right. I mean, and to, because if you strive for perfect and you expect that, well, let me, let me say it differently. It's wonderful to strive for perfection, but you have to accept that perfection is, is not reality yep. and you'll know, be okay with that. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the point. Be, be okay with it and, you know, act accordingly. That's right. That's right. So, so yeah, it, it, it's a, it's that tone is key. It definitely is key, but let me tell you, Pete, I, I have been incorporating that. It works beautifully. It really does. And it changed how I talk to my employees and it changed how I coach my, my mentees and how I teach my students. So, yeah. So that was my, I like it. So now I know when you, when you come to me and say, can I give you some feedback? <laughs> I know, I know what's coming next. So, so we'll, I uh, gave away my tricks, man. Yeah, uh, I, I know. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm you're learning. listening. Yeah, you're uh, awesome. Well, well, cool. All right. Well, we, you know, please, if you um, are interested in, in reading the article that uh, we, we published on this, it's on our website, fourcornerresources.com under our blog section. We would love to hear from you if, you have other thoughts. We, we know that this is not all encompassing and we uh, certainly are open to sharing more um, on, a, on a future podcast or answering questions as always, please email us higher calling at four corner resources.com. And as always click like subscribe to us, find us in your favorite podcast platform let us know exactly how you feel about the show like pete said send us send us an email let us know if there's any kind of uh, of uh, questions you want answered or any topics you want to hear us talk about it we'll definitely do it uh we're here every week so we're looking forward to hearing from you with that said thank you very much dry safe and good night folks thanks for listening <laughs> <laughs>